God used to dwell in a house among his people. But now he has a home that's better than the first. It doesn't look like a building with a steeple. Now he's living in the people of the church. Brick after brick, God is building his temple. Brick after brick, he's making it strong. With Christ the sure foundation and his Stones. He is building a place he can live Break after break Let us prepare our hearts and our minds this morning for the word of God and I am taking our reading from the Gospel of Luke the 24th chapter beginning at verse 13 the same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleophas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there these last few days. What things, Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Some of the women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing, and they had seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to sea, and sure enough, the body was gone, just as the women had said. Jesus said to them, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures? Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if he were going on. But they begged him, stay the night with us since it is getting late. So he went home with them. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. At that very moment, he disappeared. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us? as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us. And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them, who said, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. From verse 13, 
That same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. Later on in the story at the end, and within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. I want to speak this Easter morning under the subject of headed in the wrong direction. Headed in the wrong direction. As we are all aware, this is Easter Sunday. Some of us use the preferred phrase of Resurrection Sunday. It is a day when all of our society comes and recognizes the resurrection of Jesus Christ in one form or another. But for those who may be guests with us this morning, those who are out on internet land listening to this, you should understand that for us here at the Brick, every Sunday is Easter Sunday. Amen. Every Sunday is a celebration of the resurrected Jesus Christ. If you were here last week, we were here celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. If you were to come next week or the week after, you'll find us here celebrating our risen Lord. In this passage of scripture, Jesus makes a post-resurrection appearance. And we are told that there were several of them, several appearances, some to individuals and some to groups. Paul talked about the post-resurrection experiences in his letter to the Corinthians. He says, I pass on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said. He was buried, and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. He was seen by Peter, and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James, and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. So after Jesus was raised from the dead, he made several appearances. This is one of those appearances. It's a rather lengthy description of this encounter it's a very detailed story. It's clearly referenced in the Gospel of Mark in a shorter version. After that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Two believers, two followers of Jesus, on Easter morning, walking back home from where they came from. They were in Jerusalem at the time when he was killed and at the time he was buried. And on the day he got up from the grave, they decide to leave Jerusalem. Now, if we look at the map, Emmaus was not a very far journey for them. It was seven miles in another occasion, Jesus spoke about the importance of Jerusalem. Then he opened the minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power 
from on high. Here Jesus tells a group of disciples that Jerusalem is going to be the starting point of the church, the location for when the Holy Spirit comes, that transforming power that will change the lives of individuals and all who believe. That's going to happen here in Jerusalem, so stay. Don't leave until that happens. Don't leave the city until you receive the promise of the Spirit of God. But we find two believers who are headed in the wrong direction. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied. It gives us the name of one of those believers. Does not give us the name of the other person. As we said the other night in our Good Friday service, John records, now there by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Many believe that this Clopas is the same person here with the variation of the spelling of the name, Cleopas. Interestingly, it does not say the other disciple was a male. It does not give a name and it does not give a gender. It is therefore very possible that the other believer was not a man at all, but may have been the Mary that John was talking about. This may very well be a married couple headed home. Further evidence of that is in the conversation. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus, and at the end of their journey, Jesus acted as if he were going on, but they begged him, stay the night with us since it is getting late, so he went home with them. So these two believers lived together in a home. So they could have been brothers or they could have been the Mary and Clopas from John's gospel, the Mary that was at the cross. Whatever the case may be, we may never know. They are two believers who have decided to leave Jerusalem and head back home. And there we find that Jesus miraculously appears to them. Now, it says that God kept them from recognizing him. It reminded me of another story of when the disciples were unable to recognize Jesus Christ. It's the one where he is walking on the water when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In fear, they cried out, it is a ghost. When you're in a storm, it's hard to recognize God. When you're living in fear, it's hard to see Jesus Christ. Now, as I said, this here was a detailed story. And I want to hone in on a couple of the components there. He says, he asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short. Sadness was written on their faces. One of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there in these last few days. It's a somewhat comical story. Because Cleopas turns to this visitor and says, you must be living under a rock. <laughs> Didn't you hear about all the commotion in Jerusalem? Didn't you hear about this horrific event that took place days ago? How have you not heard this? Jesus asks, what things? Almost toying with them say, we had hoped he was the Messiah. So they are sad and they are hopeless. It is no wonder that they can't recognize Jesus. 
Because when we are discouraged, when we are hopeless, when we see life as stressful, it is hard to recognize Jesus. The conversation continues. Then some of the women from our group of his followers were at the tomb early this morning. They came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing, and they had seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. Some of the men ran out to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. I find it striking that these believers have a detailed account of everything that went wrong. They have more details than most of the followers at that time. They may have had more details than some of the apostles when this was going down. And it reminds me of how people can be today. They get on Facebook and they'll give you a detailed report of everything that has gone wrong in their life. They have nothing to say unless they can tell you all of the negative things that are happening in fine details. They'll tell you what went wrong, who did it to them, what should happen to them for doing it, and you have a long post of nothing but problems, nothing but negativity. And these disciples have this in their report. Let's look at this very carefully and see how they saw it. Some of the women from our group of his followers were at the tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing, and they had seen angels who told them Jesus was alive. Some of our men ran out to sea, and sure enough, the body was gone, just as the women said. Listen to this report. They had seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. You would think that that would be the message. They seen angels, and the angels told them Jesus is alive. So why are they leaving town? You know why? Because they didn't hear that. This is what they heard. The body was missing. Some of our men ran out to sea, and sure enough, his body was gone. They could only see the negative. They could only see what was wrong and miss the message that the angels told them, Jesus is alive. Oh, hallelujah. What are you listening to in your life? What do you choose to focus on? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. It's a fascinating passage because Jesus holds a Bible study and starts through the scriptures and starts explaining all those things you were reading in the Old Testament they were talking about me. It must have been fascinating when he said, when you read about Noah's Ark, and you see how God brought judgment down on the world, and the only way anyone could be saved, if they weren't in the Ark, judgment. He says, that's talking about me, because there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. He says, when you talk about and read about the sacrificial lamb, he's talking about me. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When you read about Jacob's ladder, a ladder that went from the earth into heaven and angels were descending and ascending on it, he was talking about me. Angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. That Passover that you celebrated days ago. 
that was talking about me, that I would be the Passover lamb. When Moses was in the wilderness and they had nothing to drink and Moses struck the rock and water came out where no water was supposed to be, he was talking about me. When Moses lifted up the brass serpent, that brass serpent was talking about me. As the serpent was lifted up, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. It must have been an eye-opening experience to see that all of the Old Testament, the scriptures were just pointing to this one occasion, to this one person. But what changed their mind? What turned the tables in this conversation? It tells us when they were sitting, having a meal. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly, their eyes were open and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. It was at the time when Jesus took the bread and broke it that their eyes were open and they said, now we can see him. Now we get it. What was it about the bread? Was it that they were thinking back on that day when he multiplied the bread and the fishes and fed 5,000 and he said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. And whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Was it when they thought back, when we heard about his last supper with his disciples, and he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It must have been the bread when they realized that when he broke the bread, that that was a symbol of his broken body, that that meant he would go and die and suffer. Thus it is written, and thus it is necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. It was that broken bread that sent the message home that the Messiah had to go to the cross, that the Messiah had to be crucified, that he had to suffer. But surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Jesus said it had to go this way. I had to take the penalty for sin. I had to taste the curse of death. But when I got up from the grave, I had conquered death. And he got up saying, I have the keys to hell and death. That all power in heaven is given unto me. And because he has the keys to hell and death. I can break every addiction that you can have. I can break the bonds of sin. I can set you free from whatever it is that has you bound. When he has the keys and he has the power, there is nothing that can bring you down. There is nothing that can turn you around. When you have the power of God, you can break depression. You can break discouragement because all power is in his hands. Oh, hallelujah. But what I really like about this story, what really moved me, is that these two believers, for whatever reason in their discouragement, were walking away. And you know, that was me. I was headed in the wrong direction. Oh, hallelujah. And he could have said, you know what? I have plenty of other believers. Let these two go away. But he cared enough about them 
to go and get these two. And that's what it means so much to me because I was headed in the wrong direction. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. I had no mind to follow Jesus. It was not in me to search him out, but he didn't leave me going in the wrong direction. He loved me enough to come and get me. On this Easter Sunday, it's more than the fact that he just got up out of the grave. That's very good news, but what's good news for me is when he got up out of the grave, he came and he got me. He wouldn't leave me alone. I didn't deserve it. Somebody said he didn't have to do it. But I want to tell you, he had to do it. Because heaven and earth were searched and no one else could be found. But he loved me enough not to let me burn in hell. He loved me enough to pick me up and turn me around. He loved me enough to put a song in my heart. Thank God that he got up. Thank God that he came for me. Thank God that he picked me up. Thank you, Jesus. Brick after brick, God is building his temple. Brick after brick, he is making it strong. With Christ the sure foundation and his people as the stones, he is building a place he can live. Break. 